Hello everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. I've been asked to stay over here, so I'm going to try my best. Uh, just keep away from the squeals here. So thanks for joining. I appreciate it. I hope everyone is refreshed after a nice break. Um, thanks for coming back after the break. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, so as I said, my name is Daniel Toms. Uh, I work at Databricks currently. Uh, that's what I look like without a beard. Um, so I uh, went to Norman, Oklahoma, which is a state in the middle that everybody flies over. Uh, and that's where I went to school and I got my master's nearby there. I did big oil for about seven years and I helped to bring big data in the early Hadoop days to uh, the oil and gas industry in the Texas region of the United States. Um, kind of got tired of the state that no one wanted to go to, so I went out to North Carolina. Um, and that's where I live now, where I worked um, for about three years, or I'm sorry, just over two years at Cloudera and have been at Databricks for just over two and a half years. So I'm going to try to, as quickly as possible, tell you about this really cool new thing called a feature factory today. And it works in, theoretically, all the industries um, with a different level of tweaking depending on the industry you're in. Um, but if we think about something, if you think about in data science in any industry, it doesn't really matter what the industry is, it always has these contextual paradigms where you have a concept or a context and you'll have features that are obviously related to them or metrics or things that relate to that concept in some way or other. Sometimes these lines are more clear than others. Um, and I have a lot of examples that I'm not going to go through all of them on the board here, but uh, these are examples of places that we've implemented feature factories and kind of the ways that the concepts unraveled as we started to implement. I'm actually stationed here in Germany right now. Uh, well, not here in Germany, but there in Germany. Um, here in Europe. Um, right now, working with a, with a client there where I'm actually implementing a version of the feature factory and uh, also a counterpart called AutoML. Uh, AutoML Toolkit, I was to say that too. So um, without any further ado, let me tell you about how we're going to implement this and, why the, and how we're going to try and make this as easy as possible. Because let's face it, in engineering features is not really easy or all the time fun. Um, so maybe there's a better way. And if you think about the way that business works, it's been running for a lot longer than I've been around, obviously. Um, and it's always been measured and implemented through metrics and KPIs. And the, the path and the trajectory of the business typically um, is driven by KPIs. So these KPIs are pretty much made up of metrics and um, they seem to have been working pretty well for a long time. So what I'd like to do is try to conceptualize and contextualize these different metrics, put them together in a way that's easy to follow um, and allow us to manipulate them through code really quickly and easily to much more quickly and easily develop new features. So before I get there, let me talk a little bit about measures, metrics, and features because everyone, I think, has a little bit different idea. Um, the idea of a measure uh, is like a number, 31. 31, you're all probably thinking, what the heck is 31 right now? It's just a number. It's a measure. Okay? Add a plus in front of it, and all of a sudden, you know exactly what it is. It's the Netherlands country code, right? And see, I know we're in the Netherlands. <laughs> but if I tell you that it's 0 .00242 blah, 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 what is that now? Well, maybe that's the number, the population, as a representation of the entire world of the people that have the plus 31 country code. So there's also 100 or maybe more, maybe an infinite, almost infinite uh, way of developing features and driving features from this 31 country code that may or may not um, uh, be predictive or help you toward developing or delivering your model. And I think we've probably, uh, I mean, how many data scientists do I have in the room? Whatever that word means, right? Okay, he's self-proclaimed. <laughs> cool. So. Uh, data engineers, it looks like most of you raised your hand, so we have a lot of data scientists, but I know that you're probably also a data engineer. Um, this is an age-old battle since data scientist coins were termed, who does what and how does it work and why can't we do more data science and less data munging. Um, but the fact of the matter is that today most organizations are still pretty nascent in their ability to develop and deliver processes that allow that communication to work well and fluid. So what the Feature Factory is going to try to do um, is to fatten the gap there, like make the pipe a little bigger, and help ease the communication. If you think about this process, and if you read through these, you've lived it, and there's an, I started drawing lines, and then it got stupid, so I just removed the lines, because you can go in any kind of recursive loop, um, pretty much anywhere through here, and there can be months or years between any of those lines. Um, depending on how deep you go into these rabbit holes, um, it can take a very long time. But let's focus on those things that really annoy us, um, such as the going back to the business to try and figure out business logic. How do I make this join? What's the proper group by? Um, can I union it with this? Or is that going to make some kind of weird mistake? And 
oh my gosh, everyone else has already figured this out before. Why am I doing it yet again and bothering the business? Um, and now they want me to actually sit in IT for now for some reason. And now I have to go find a way back to IT and talk to my old friends. And now I have also moved somewhere else. So this is the, this is the world, right? Um, and so what I'd like to enable through the Feature Factory is a way for us to keep track of these learnings that we create as organizations. And if we go back to metrics, the good news is the business already understands their metrics, and they probably maybe maybe have written them down uh, somewhere or documented them somewhere on how they run these KPIs or these metrics. And maybe we can utilize some of those as well. So with the end in mind, I always like to start at the end and work backwards. So let me do that here today uh, with you really quick. So what we want to get to before the end of this talk is something that looks like this. You have a store. You want to create trend lines out of something. Um, we have this thing called multiple multiplication or multiplicative features, uh, basically a feature set that we can that can be multiplied with other feature sets or other concepts. Um, we're going to set some trend time ranges, and then we're just going to get all of all the trend lines we can for that for that feature set there. And then we're going to have some magic sauce here. The magic sauce ties through the feature factory, which is FF there, um, and through that we're going to have some base data frame that we're just going to then smash a whole bunch of features onto. And hopefully it all is going to work by the end of, the, end of this talk. Okay. And I know you have more questions than answers at this point, but that's okay. So I know that I know my business sort of, um, but I don't know what I know. So I just try to guess at what I think I know. Um, and this is kind of where I wind up as a data scientist half the time. Um, and then I realize how much work it is when I try to go in these infinite circles to actually get new features or derive new concepts. So I kind of try to skip some, um, but maybe I shouldn't because maybe those actually are do have value to what I'm trying to to whatever target I'm trying to predict. So maybe we can just build all of them um, as long as we can get them quickly. Uh, we can just build them all, and with the power of Spark and other um, actually pretty incredible technologies we have in the cloud today. Um, and all the compute power, we can just dump them all in and to these different methods that we have now to find out which features are actually important to whatever we're trying to do. Um, if you're in some kind of deep learning or unsupervised uh, methodology, maybe you just keep them all and go along with your day. Um, but either way, um, let's talk about why we want to do this. We talked a little bit about the different pieces of it, but the reusability piece is enterprise, uh, amazing, like it makes the enterprise happy because we're, and you, um, if you like to read other people's features. Um, but ideally, that's what's going to happen, right? You're going to start to get these features um, that are already contextualized for you, and then you can just get them and then play with them. Somebody else created them. Somebody else said that they were right, and they were correct. The business logic was good. So now you can use them. Um, so think of that in that way of like a feature repository. Also, the business logic should be consistent in there. Um, because it's been through a code review, ideally, um, there's also some optimizations that have been done to make sure no stupidity stuff was done um, in the Spark piece or whatever. Um, also, it really this is actually really important, and I know that as data scientists we all love process, right? I mean, we just like to go around it. Um, but the process here is really great for the enterprise and for you as well because this most enterprise, most organizations have a really hard time starting to build that process from a from a blank slate. How, what should a process look like between my data engineering organization and my data science organization? How should they communicate and when? They don't really understand how that works. But now we've taken something, maybe like a feature factory, and we have these API points, and now the questions start to become pretty clear. Like, I know when I need to know this, so the next step becomes kind of clear. So while the feature factory is in no way a process in the ending of itself, it acts as sort of an anchor point for you and your organization to build process around. And hopefully, one day get to the point where you as a data scientist can submit a ticket uh, for a new set of features and your data engineer can go back and justify the cost of it and get it and deliver it to you in a relatively short amount of time through the feature factory which will then be usable for you and everyone else plus that code and that pipeline of data should be man man managed and maintained. Maybe we can finally document our features um, not only in English or whatever your language is, but also perhaps in the actual code and how it was implemented uh, through something that's fairly simple to read, like SQL. And then uh, we have scaled this up to over 10,000 features um, with a fairly reasonable size cluster. I think they had you know 40 nodes or something like that um, to run this in a few minutes. Uh, it does utilize oftentimes 125% utilization on the cluster for the whole runtime. Uh, so we have proven that it is quite quite um, scalable. Okay, 
so what is this thing? This, this, it sounds great. Does it work? Is this vaporware? What is this? Um, so it's really like a code base. Uh, right now I'm going to show you in Python, um, but I'll show you this code base today. Um, but it's not complete, right? It's a demo um, that you have to then do a little work on. I'm sorry, but you do. Um, so it's not quite done, but it is extensible um, and customizable and also need your, need your love and attention for your industry or your organization. I know that as a data scientist, though, every time you start a new problem, you build a feature factory. You just don't put it in a place that everyone else can use it later, and you don't really make sure that it's um, gone through all the right checks necessarily. Uh, so all I'm saying is instead of just throwing it into some kind of notebook somewhere and willy-nilly throwing together stuff and hoping for the best, um, perhaps we go through a little bit more uh, arduous process of getting the, the feature put together, um, and maybe, you, you be the judge, but maybe we can find a way to do it simpler. So how does it work? Basically, take the demo, or take this demo that I'm going to show you today, land it, rip it out, rename a few things, and implement your features and your feature families. So just build the scaffolding for you. Um, identify those major concepts and implement your pieces. This is going to confuse you more than it's going to help you at this moment, but I wanted to keep it in the deck so that you will have it for later because this is the abstract architecture. It doesn't really tell you much about how it's implemented, but it will, it will help you as you refer back to it um, in the future, which I hope you do. So let's go into a more concrete example because that helps. Um, that's going to help us a lot, I hope. Um, how many of you have used the TPC DS data set or know what it is? Just know what it is. Okay, so we're going to have to take a second here. So it's essentially a data set, and you'll hear them talking about it on this, the keynotes and stuff all the time. Um, when they run this engineering benchmark against TPCDS, it's, uh, they heard it this morning, it was the fastest in the world. Um, okay, that's what it's usually used for, but it's a big data set that I can scale up, and it usually is something to do with uh, sales. Like, so the TPCDS data set is basically sales, returns, inventory. It's kind of like if you owned a merchandising company, um, and you were selling stuff, uh, maybe through retail or something. So here's the ERD, um, and what I did was I actually just generated, I clicked the right buttons and generated a terabyte of data um, to, to test this and demonstrate um, the feature factory on. So in this example, we have, uh, well, in TPC DS, you have um, three channels of sales. You have stores, catalog, and web. So, you know, go back to 2001 and 2 and 3 where you had um, catalogs, and that's when this was created. So here we have store, web, and catalog, uh, store, catalog, and sales. We have returns and we have sales. Okay, this is actually quite important. Um, there's also a whole bunch of things like cost that you could derive, profit analysis, inventory, customer segmentation. You could do a lot of fun stuff with this. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you build a model on it because it's uh, fake data. But either way, it does what it needs to do for our purposes. So as I look through this TPC DS data set, I say, okay, what is, what is that major concept of what I'm going to work with? Um, I want to help my, my company make, uh, my organization make more money. So we have three major concepts here. We have store, catalog, and web, and those are my scopes. So I'm going to call those a channel, a channel of sales. And that's going to be my major concept. So we actually go into store, web, and catalog as major concepts, and we call those channels. So the things in green are the things that you pretty much have to implement. Um, everything else is pretty much done for you. Uh, and then there's actually a significant number of other little goodies and nuggets you'll find in the code that will help you along your journey. This, though, is very um, high level. So let's zoom in a, a, a bit more. So we have this uh, master concept of the channel. And like I said, we have the store, the web, and the, f and the catalog. Um, before I told you that I want to conceptualize and contextualize these features together so that I can reference them as a concept rather than building features kind of at, at, at random um, as I think of them. So we now are going to zoom in um, to store and then zoom in further into sales. When you think about sales, there's different types of sales, right? There's like gross sales, net sales, weekend sales, holiday sales, go on, right? Um, all of these would be features uh, in this context would be features of a feature family called sales. So with when I want to go to sales and get all my features that everybody's ever created um, for, for sales, I can just say get all, and it will return all the features that have ever been validated um, and put into the feature factor for me. In addition, I can register my own and create new ones on the fly um, and, and move forward. 
So let's zoom a little further in. Um, now, what is a store? So this is where it gets. This is where your implementation starts to take hold, because a channel has some specific implementations, but it was too deep for this talk. Um, they're not hard at all. Uh, when you go in, it's not. It's not a. It's not amazing code, guys. I'm not like a, a great coder. I just thought this up, and we've been using it for a long time. So you're going to have a lot better. Uh, ideas than I did probably as you implement them and every time I implement it I find new things but this is the way we've implemented it for now um, and so the channel has some basic stuff because every store web and catalog are going to inherit from channel so those things that are at the top level we're going to pull down and then uh, inside a store you're going to have some things that are that are specific to each one of these individual items store um, web and and catalog are each going to have these pieces in green are going to be fairly specific to that type of concept. Okay, so let's get into some code. So if I want to land this thing and work on it, what do I need to do? First, um, I'm going to clone the repo, fork the repo, repo. Um, and then the first thing I have to do is define what my concept is. I have channel in this demo, but you might have something else. You can refer back to that main industry slide um, to get some ideas on how that might look, but you've got to figure out one or many different concepts that you're going to work with uh, throughout your time using the Feature Factory. Um, and then everything else will follow. Now we just need to implement the feature family, the first kind of grouping of concepts, or the gr first grouping of feature families, because here, sales.py is your feature family. I'm going to put them all inside of my channel store, um, but this is all very loosely tied. You just need to implement what makes sense for you. I put it in a folder called channel demo store, and I started building my feature families. The first one I implemented here is called sales. Okay. And inside of that sales.py, inside of that feature family, which inherits from feature family master, um, has all of my individual features. Uh, and those are defined as feature objects, which we'll get into in a little bit, actually, now. Um, and these are actually, the, this is the definition of a feature object. A little bit too deep to go into, but the cool thing is that you can import this as a feature. You can import this object or this class, and you can build as many, however deep a loop as you want, um, and start filling out the blanks. Uh, and create your own derivative of features as you like uh, in, in a notebook, in, in Spark, wherever you are. Just build your own if you want. Um, and that's how I start building things called multipliers, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, actually, we'll talk about multipliers now. Actually, let me uh, dig into this just a minute. Um, here we have a feature uh, called net store sales. And um, we have the filter here, which uh, allows us to do any kind of filtering. So anything that is any column that returns a true or false. Uh, or any list of columns that returns a true or false um, will be a filter. If it returns false, what, what value should I put there? Um, and then any kind of function that I want to, if I'm doing an aggregate, any kind of aggregate function. Um, obviously, it's easier to use things like sum that have already been defined, but you can also define your own UDFs. Um, hopefully, they're vectorized, but you can define your own UDFs as well and put them in here as well. If you're not using an aggregate, if you're not, if you're not grouping by anything, then um, it wouldn't need to be an aggregate function. It would just be a regular function. So this is very flexible, and, a lot, and th notice I didn't implement everything. A lot of it's defaulted to, what, to nothing. Um, so you just put in the pieces that you need. OK, so, so far all I've done is kind of obfuscate what you do every time. Um, but now we're going to get into some of the things that make the Feature Factory really help. OK, so let's take some feature families here as a normal, um, normal business might have. Sales, customers, some weather, some geography data, maybe that's geo for uh, Cartesian data, map data, ge geospatial data, whatever. Um, and then we're going to take some pretty common multipliers. Um, and by the way, these are in the repo for you already to use. Uh, time, categoricals, and trends. So let's assume that I, um, and this is where we kind of deviate from metrics and go more into features. And I realize that there are scaling and all of that other fun <coughs> stuff that you can do to features. But imagine just a metric that's kind of bound by some other metric, like time. So here we go from total sales, which would be our metric. Um, and, and total sales is what would be defined as a metric inside of our uh, feature family, inside of that sales.py. Um, but now we're going to then multiply it by time. So now we're not just going to get, for this person, uh, we're not just, or for this store, we're not just going to get total sales, but we're going to get total sales for the last six months. But it's really easy for me to just say 1, 3, 6, 12, and now I have a series of trends. Uh, or a series of groupings by time. Now I have total sales for one month, six month, and imagine how much tweaking that has to you have to do every time. You want this thing all the time. You want to you want to bound and bucket these by time. So now we can do this with one line of code. 
Um, but now let's go into somewhat of a more realistic scenario where you want to know total sales when there was some kind of fair, when it was sunny outside, and when they, this store sold how many men's shoes. Okay, now we're getting into more of a real world problem and where it starts to get a little trickier when you're trying to develop this in SQL. And I know a lot of you have codes, code base that develops code. Um, I've seen it all over. Uh, people write SQL, SQL coders that code SQL <laughs> um, to help you with this. Uh, and that's sort of what this is, I guess, um, but hopefully a little bit easier to use. Another quick example is multiplying customers by the geographical ranges by time by a categorical like checkout method. So again, one line of code, or maybe two, um, to generate a feature that's that complex. But not only that, but you could also generate maybe with the same less than 20 lines of code, 55,000 features. And if you look at this, because we can multiply m the derivative of, multi of the outputs of multiplies, um, this gets to be a big number really fast. But the, uh, uh, the number of permutations of features that you can develop with very few features. In this case, we have what we have eight sales metrics, eight customer metrics, a couple of categorical um, uh, features, um, and then some time box windows. And with those just few things, meanwhile, we also only have to document those things. So that's pretty cool. Um, and now everything twists together, multiplies together, and we have 55,000 options. Um, more commonly, you don't use all nine windows, and you don't multiply by everything, and you don't always multiply the output of something by the <laughs> by everything else either. So normally, you wind up with you know, a thousand to five or ten thousand features is pretty common, um, and then you'll throw that into some kind of feature importance, feature selection algorithm um, to identify feature correlation. You're gonna do covariance testing and figure it all, like, then move forward into more of the machine learning stuff, which is what we enjoy more, right? So um, that's what the multipliers do. You can build your own multipliers, uh, and I expect that you will. And I, every time I implement this, I have to build new ones. Um, the trends one is in here as well as I mentioned, and that just fits a line. Um, over some time period so that you can do forecasting and projections. Um, the next thing is the joiners and groupers. So as I know, joins um, are slow and inefficient um, typically. Uh, hopefully this will help at least get the most efficient join that you can. But the good news is that once you have a joiner that's been registered uh, in your inventory uh, or once a feature needs it, it's going to use that joiner once and only once. And I didn't put the code up here because we're going to be a little short on time. And we actually are refactoring that right now. Uh, there's a pull request that actually links to the pull request for it. Um, it's already the code's already written, just hasn't been tested uh, at scale. So we are re redoing that a little bit. But joiners and groupers are basically just a way for a feature. In the event that I need some data from this table over here that's relevant to this concept, it has the map of how to go get it and apply it to the current data frame so that it has what it needs. But once and only once. The same is for AGs. AGs are getting, like, that's really been getting annoying for me over the past year or two um, as I've been doing more and more machine learning because everything I need to get counts and I need to get more numbers and everything. So join this, get AGs over here, get grouped by this. So this will manage and uh, keep a track of all your groupers um, and do those also once and only once. So I will just leave it at that. And this is going to help a lot whenever you go to your next project and it looks like this. Um, they say, hey, do A and B, um, here, go. Um, I'll talk to you in six months, please have it done. That literally just happened to me. Um, this, And then they're like, okay, here's another one, by the way. I forgot to tell you about this data set. And then you ask some more questions, and then there's another one. But only that one, actually only this piece. So when this happens, um, this is where the joiners and groupers are going to really help you. And also, as a data scientist sitting down to start working on a project um, that might have something to do with sales, uh, or something to do with uh, store sales more specifically. Um, you don't have to wade through all that mess that I just showed you because you're just going to say, you know, list my sources and my, my cores that are relevant to store that have already been discovered before. Um, so if it's already been done once before, um, I already know what's there and available. Plus my joiners and my groupers are going to be driven, driven from this. Um, as well as all of the logic for multipliers. So I have the inventory of stuff I need and if I don't have something, I can just register a new one, custom data set, whatever. Throw it in there, and now I can build new joiners that are going to implement that new data set and make it available at runtime. Okay? Um, so this is an example of, you know, when you have store implemented, you can list sources, list cores, and it gives you a list of, of, what, of what tables you might have. And these can be actually um, remote JDBC connections uh, if you didn't want to pull it in and maintain it. Um, it can be any data frame. So think about all the sources that you have available. Um, they don't have to reside on a Delta Lake 
um, or any, any um, data lake that, that's inside of Hive or anything like that. Okay, um, the next thing is like the Grim Reaper. Um, every single time I implement some new concept, they seem to find a new way to manage time and date. Um, and even, even sometimes in the same table, time and date is different. Uh, so um, I, I, I went through this hell one last time um, to implement this date time manager. And what this does is allows us to uniform to whatever format I freaking want. I can just put it in my config and tell it I want everything that I'm going to talk about over the next however long I'm going to use this, this store, this is how I'm going to use date time. Um, and then everything else will conform through this interface to make sure that everything um, looks the same. Even at the bottom layer, when those, those register tables, they won't, you're not going to change the data there. It's just going to go through that twister to make sure that it's like you want it. So we're going to discover the date time format as best we can. You might have to extend it um, for all the crazy stuff out there. Um, but we're going to keep, that, keep, that tra keep track of that and register it for you. OK. Next thing I won't talk too much about here, but it's the config. Um, the idea of the config is fully uh, transpar full transparency. Uh, there's a lot going on in here and a, and a lot of setup. Uh, so it's nice whenever you can just say, give me the configs and see the list not only of what data you have, how your time uh, dimensions are configured, but also like how your joiners and your groupers are set up, the logic that was used to join them, so that you can validate and find bugs in your data at, um, you know, in interactive mode. Um, obviously, this is not as deep as you'd want to go in real life. You would probably want to add a lot more fun stuff to this config, but it's the, the, the scaffolding is there for you to just add anything you want. And with the beauty of untyped Python, <laughs> I can add anything I want in here. Uh, and you'll notice I have, so I can have direct access to data frames and uh, you know through the through the config. Um, and then also there's a serialize a deserializer to, to to string if I want to pretty print it. Um, the next thing is the um, the easy documentation. I mentioned that, and uh, because I don't know all of your languages, um, uh, English or German or Dutch, uh, I didn't implement that uh, in this base demo. But I implemented this piece here so that you can see all of the code that generates the feature. So you can log this to ML Flow, put it alongside your model, and then whenever you need to come back and do inference later, you can actually see how the features were created. And if anything's changed in the Git repo since these features were developed, to generate your model, now you'll know why the features that you're now using the, the, are different than the ones that were used to generate the model. Um, so feel free to you know make this right for you because this is just a, a getting starting point, in my opinion. Every time I implement this, it changes a lot. Um, and that's kind of the hard part and where I'm going to go into um, as my excuse here. Uh, the code that you're going to see is um, only kind of like a, what I put together for a demo. Um, every time I go to a customer, I pretty much do that. I fork the, fork the main repo and then um, start twisting and actually implementing the thing. So luckily, it's only a few files to get started, and then you're writing features. Okay. Um, so let's jump over to the demo. I know that you guys are probably oh so sick of PowerPoint. Um, so let me try to mirror here. Hopefully, I didn't mess up all the recordings. Um, bear with me. Here we go. Oops, that's now the wrong screen. Oh, and before I forget, let me go ahead and um, go to, so this is github.com slash Databricks Labs. Um, and down here at the bottom, um, the way that you access this repo is I'm going to open source it right now. If I can type the name, feature. Oh, I needed that. So we will do that in a moment. But it will be done before you get to your computer. Man, it's good. You can't go look at it yet. Okay, so I've got a little. I've got a little setup here. Um, so I'm going to implement or import some basics here just to get started. And I may not run all this live just for time. Um, but you can see what's happening here. Uh, we have. We're going to uh, implement store. And one of the things that the date time manager does is allow you to uh, move, like grab areas of dates. So in machine learning all the time, right, I want to get my statistics from three years ago, my training set from one year ago, do some testing over some other time period. So this is going to basically time bucket your, your uh, data 
um, based on a snapshot date and any rules you configure. In this case, we're going to grab 12 months prior to this uh, January 31st, 20, uh, 2002. And then we're going to grab the feature factory from store. So this is all you have to do to get store, and everything comes with it. Um, so as a new data scientist sitting down for the first time, um, you've never worked with this before, so you're going to look, what is store? Like, what are my sources? What are my cores? How do the joiners look? What groupers do I have? Like, what features might, what feature families might I have, et cetera? Um, then you realize, like, hey, I know of a better table than this. There's one that's optimized over here, so I'm going to change this data source from here to there. I want to change my time range. I also don't like my date time format, so I'm going to change that to the one I like. Um, it's super easy. All you have to do is just uh, type in, like we've added dot notation updates so you're not managing dictionaries with all the brackets. Um, so now you just navigate through dots to update any part of your config. Um, you can also remove, add, and if you add o over top of something else, it will just update. Um, and then you can also get them the same. All right. So I went then, because it's, con it's extensible here, I can actually create a new store. So I changed my config. Now I, wanted, I, got, I got a store by the default pull out the config, edit a little bit, and now generate a new store um, with my config. And now everything comes back uh, with the changes I just made. Now I have a, a better store. OK, so um, what's the base data? Notice I only have a few tables. Uh, store sales and store returns are kind of my cores, which are kind of like fact tables. I use, I use these as cores and sources to get my facts versus my dimensional, slow change dimensions. You can put them all into just sources if you want, whatever. Um, whatever is good for you. And then you can get these data. But notice these are actual data frames. So you're ready to work. You just sat down. You just saw what there is, and now you're perusing the data, um, assuming you had access. Uh, so that's that's, I mean, faster than you could imagine for like what store data is relevant. You don't have to go to the business or anything, right? So the next thing I'm going to do is just get a base data frame to start working with. Uh, this is going to give me um, just my basic uh, what I need to group by, essentially, and an ID and a few other goodies maybe. Uh, in this case, it's just going to give me the store sales, which is the raw fact. I'm just going to get that core here. And I'm going to join it with item, just to get started. And here, uh, I didn't run this, but I wanted to show you. Um, if you don't want all of the features in a feature family, so this, what this is doing is saying, go to store, grab the feature family sales, and then grab me these two um, features out of sales. Um, and then just get. And now I have a feature set of these. What I could also do is just get all. Um, and that's going to give me all my multipliable and all my base features. So notice that there's a difference between multipliable and base because if I have days since first transaction, I don't want to multiply by that by time. So I might need to handle those a little differently. So everything that's generally multipliable, I put those in the multipliable type uh, features, and the other ones are base. And that's, again, just how I did it. You can do whatever, whatever suits you. Um, OK, now if we want to look at the features that I have in uh, my now multiple multi Pliable features feature set. Um, I have them here, just net sales, total quantity, and and I, again, these are all goofy. Uh, just they're a demo. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to do the magic sauce here, which is just uh, the append features. Um, so that's really the entry point um, when you want to use this. Just fe the feature factory append features, and what you're inputting here is your base data frame, any ags you might want to do, um, and then you're passing in a list of all the feature sets that you've built. So that's what you do. You build feature sets through the feature factory and through all of these uh, feature families. And then you use append to just append them all. And now you wind up with your original data frame plus all your features. And you can stack them. So the output is a features data frame. And maybe I want to add at a different level or I want to grab something from a different feature family. Now I just take the output data frame, and now that becomes the input to my next set. So now I can build actual ML pipelines and extend pipelines to allow me to start stacking uh, data frames. And this is where you usually wind up uh, as you get into a more advanced deployment of the feature factory. Um, and then you can write it out. And you notice that it only took uh, like 0 0.06 seconds uh, to do that, and that was obviously not very many. Uh, if you have a larger driver, um, you know, maybe a I won't say the types, but maybe you have like eight cores or 16 cores um, in a thousand features. You're looking at two minutes maybe on the driver to figure it all out, depending on the depth of your joiners and whatnot. Um, and then uh, 57 seconds to read it out. And we're working with a terabyte of data here. So we, we aren't um, skimping on, on the data here, the data, the data size. However, when I implemented store up here and I gave it that date, it went ahead, the date time manager was nice, and went ahead and applied all the time-based uh, partitions uh, for me based on the configuration um, in store. So I don't even have to worry about how to configure my, how to prune my data um, every, because I have everything I need. All right. 
Uh, is that two minutes to questions or two minutes to the end? Okay. All right, and then lastly, the documentation, which I already showed you. Um, all of this, and if you actually go into any feature set and go to the features and go to the actual feature, you hit dot and you can see all the parameters that are available there. So there'll be a list of things that you can grab, add more things if you want, and then send those to MLflow as you like. Okay, um, I wanted to get more into multipliers. Uh, this is where it starts to get cool, um, but I think I'm gonna run out of time here. Here what we're doing is we're going to get the date range multiplier. Um, and then we're just going to multiply one feature set by this multiplier and output outcomes all of our features for that by those buckets for of time. And uh, my base ones, I didn't configure any because default is 12 months uh, by quarter, um, but you can default them to whatever you want and, uh, and whatnot. So just going down a little further, when we add categorical multipliers as well, uh, you can start to see, you can really start to generate a lot of features. Um, depending on the number of time buckets you have and the number of categoricals you have. So now we're starting to get, get pretty big. I think we have like 150 features-ish, 136 features now. Now we can continue on and add trending features. Uh, with uh, Trends is actually a feature family, um, and it uses the time-based multiplier, so we're actually reusing the components that we've already created now already, um, to apply trends to all the features in, multiply fe in multipliable features. And then we're just going to append those as well. And now we get slope intercepts for all of our, um, all of our trends. So we're going to fit those lines and get those. This demo is inside of the Git repo. Uh, this demo notebook is in the Git repo as well. You can, it's uh, exported as HTML and as a DBC. So if you use Databricks, you can import it and play. Um, otherwise, it's an HTML, so you can read it. Um, and then this TPCDS data set will be available on Databricks data sets uh, as soon as I can get it out. <laughs> so. Thanks. I hope to take your questions now. Well, thank you, Daniel. Do we have any questions? Hi, thanks for that. Um, so I'm wondering, are there any safeguards with respect to preventing information leakage? Say, for example, mm -hmm. a new data scientist comes in and they just call some function, um, some class of function, and then all of a sudden they have information leakage from their yep. target variable. Of course, um, we usually put those in. Uh, during implementation, but there's no way I can generalize them enough uh, to, to give it to you. So I don't have it here, but yes, you can absolutely put those safeguards in. Okay, thanks. I mean, the, the answer to all, all your questions, can you do it, is yes. It's, it's just um, how, how long does it take, really? Oh, that was really a good presentation. Uh, yeah. uh, how do you actually calculate the features for non-numerical data sets, say categorical? So what sort of, uh, you can't, this is non-numerical, so you can't apply an aggregate method on top of it. Well, I don't actually apply a, um, the ca the the categorical just mul is a multiplier, so it just basically does a pivot um, on the the numericals by some categorical column. So it gives me the feature by that, and you'll notice it's almost like one hot encoding, uh, but not um, because we're at an aggregate level right now. Uh, let me come up here. You'll notice where's my list of here are these. So these are actually like the what was the twelve month net sales per quantity where the category was home. So it's, it's given me this by this when I do the categorical multiplier. If you want to do it, if you, if you don't have a group by, then it's just going to one-hot encode them. So it's, for an example, postcode could be categorical because it's in a limited set of uh, values. So how would you implement any feature uh, on top of the postcode or something like that? Postcard? Yeah, postcode. Oh, postcode? Uh, yeah. Well, that, yeah, if you want to make that a categorical, then as, if you have a column of postcode, but... Um, you can pivot it out just like we just did with the category as a categorical. Just tell it that that's a categorical column. But usually with postcodes, it gets more complicated. So you would want to. I usually create a geo feature family, which has more logic to when you twist geo by something else. There's a little bit you define more of a of a polygon or something or uh, for a region, uh, or you define some sub subset of total. Um, and postcode. how would it be? This feature store would be useful for my particular use case. This is in a very generalized way where you have a particular data as a snapshot. And if I have a labels file, and that would relate to my use case, and I would like to create features on top of uh, I'm using my labels file. So how would I, is it possible to create a feature store using my labels file for a particular use case with this? I have to know a little bit more, but if you're trying to talk about like how you can filter down to like some change, so instead of doing time snapping, do some other kind of snap, not exactly. Uh, so you have a labels file where it states, like for this user, this is the outcome, this is my training labels file. And I'd like to generate, say instead of having a snapshot date out there, you would provide a date for every single user. 
and you would create right, the same okay. set of features. I have a dynamic. I, there's a, yes, there's a, dynamic. For like marketing, when you have touch dates. Absolutely. Yeah, we have we have dynamic. Uh, another type, this is by default, if you look at the config, this is a month snap. There's also one called dynamic snap. Um, and then you just pass in the date column for the touch. And then it would every row would have its own snapshot. All right, we are out of time. Uh, thanks again, Daniel. And please don't forget to thanks, rate sir. the talk using the app. Thank you.